following lecture was given to the Oriental Numismatic Society by Joe Cribb on the 22nd of June, 2019. Okay, well, this talk is derived from work I'm doing on the coin finds collected by Charles Masson in Afghanistan in the 1830s. Coins are in the British Museum and in the Fitzwilliam Museum and in the British Library. And my colleague, former colleague Elizabeth Errington has been working on the, the, his finds for the last 20 years and is now publishing a series of books. Two are al already published. The third one is now in preparation. And I've been writing uh, a sort of overview of the history of the site of Begram as recorded by the coins that he found. And in doing that, I found a, a very interesting group of coins which weren't from Begram, but were acquired by Masson in the bazaar in Kabul, which has sort of led me over the last couple of months on a, a, a sort of interesting inquiry into what is happening in Afghanistan in this period when Islam has, has arrived, but the local states retain some independence. And the Arab army, led by Arabs, but also, almost certainly containing all sorts of other components. And they arrived in, in eastern Iran and finished off the Sasanian state. And they captured Herat and Seistan, which are on the um, western edge of Afghanistan, within 31 years of the beginning of the Muslim era. So very early. And they continued their push forward into northwestern Afghanistan and managed to defeat um, the local ruler there. Um, this is a district called Juzjan. And in the same year, they reached Balkh and had a fight, pushed back. But 10 years later, they captured Balkh as well. And these areas retained some autonomy, but acknowledged the um, Arabs as their overlords. And some, some people converted, but not, not everybody. And for south of the Hindu Kush, the Arabs also tried to continue this forward push, but they kept meeting with resistance. And so they, they pushed into the area, you know, the year after they'd taken Balk. And again, 40 years later, they had another attempt. But the rulers based in Ghazni and Kabul, continued to maintain their independence, and, and um, Islamic rule um, only really was achieved in this area in the ninth century. So this area re retained some level of independence for a long time. And I'm going to look at what's going on at the during this period when coinage that's locally made um, is being issued with some cognizance of, Ar of Arab coinage, but with some level of independence. And this um, group of coins that I discovered, um, bought in Kabul, um, it was a hoard, which consists of about 214 silver coins. And m most of them are in the British Museum and the Fitzwilliam. But there's also a group here in the Ashmolean, um, because when Charles Masson acquired it in 1834, in the city, there was also a man called Gerard, who was French, traveling around, acquiring coins. And he then went to Calcutta, and he seems to have sold coins to Princep, Lady Eden, and J.B. Elliot. So the Elliot coins are here. Uh, the Eden coins are in the British Museum. So it seems to be a, a, a separate parcel of this hoard ended up in Calcutta and entered collections there. And the, the hoard is characterized as largely Arab Sasanian coins. And... They have countermarks on them. This is the most common countermark, this sort of loop with a circle in the middle. But there are also countermarks with inscriptions on them. So you can see this is from Masson's own manuscript, which is in the British Library. And this is another coin from Masson's collection, illustrated in 1841 by um, Horace Wilson um, in his account of coinage in that area, largely based on Masson's collection. The countermarks um, that are most interesting are ones which have a tamga, uh, like this, and are written in Bactrian, which is the, the, um, the language of northern Afghanistan. It's an Iranian language, and it's written using Greek. 
So although it doesn't look like Greek, one can uh, see the, the sigma, the kappa, the alpha, gamma, and the omega. So it says skago. And Bactrian, the, the final O's are not normally pronounced, so it's, his name is Skag. And lots of the coins have his countermark um, on them. There's also uh, w one coin with another name, which also appears with the same tamga, and it appears, you know, f by looking through the trade and collections, I found s several more. These seem to say Besato, so uh, Besut is how it was probably pronounced. So you can see the, the countermark here of Besut, and here's Besut, and then there's another countermark, which is the third of them, which is a man called Julad, and it's Greek, in Greek it's Zolado, and you see again the Tamga, and the long Z going underneath, and again the letters A, O, and D in Bactrian look very similar. It's only really from the way they join together that you can normally tell which letter is which. And at the end of the hoard, there are also coins issued by the last of those countermarkers, a man whose name is Julard Zolado. So here is his name, Zolado. And he has an epithet, Guzgano, which means of Juzjan, the, the area in northwestern Afghanistan. And on the back, in Bactrian again, it's written to be read from here. It says that he's the king of Gar, of Gore whatever that means. So it says Gori Go Shaho, and there's, there's his name in full with my crude drawing of the inscription. So these coins seem to be the last in the hoard, and so the fact that Masson bought it in Kabul, um, and he said it seems to come from Turkestan. What he means is it comes from north of the mountain, because at that time, where there were Turks, they called it Turkestan, even though it was part of what we now call Afghanistan. And the, the coins which he bought prob probably came from north of the Pindakush, but there have been finds of um, Arab Sasanian coins with similar countermarks in the Punjab and in Swat. So it's possible that this hoard might have come from somewhere more local. The co these coins are also distinguished by having a mint name written in both pa uh, Pahlavi, which says Anbir, and also in Bactrian, and it says Ambero. So the, these coins are, are marked both in the local language, but also in the Pahlavi that's used on Arab Sasanian coins with the name of its mint. And Anbir is an ancient city in northern, northwestern Afghanistan. So the whole of the hoard, as reconstructed from these different collections, shows that the, the these are the coins that relate to the mint of An. And bear. Um, so the last coins have written in both Bactrian and Pahlavi. These are Julad's co own coins. And there are earlier coins, which I'll come to in a minute, with the same mint name. And they represent the latest coins, so they're being issued in the early 8th century. The other large bulk of coins are coming from Khorasan, which is the area to the west of Juzjan, so Merv, Merv al Rud. Um, in, in both in t uh, Turkmenistan and a couple of mints in north uh, eastern Iran, and um, also coins on the edge of Afghanistan, which was under Arab control. So, the, so these are all, you know, mostly Arab Sasanian coins, and you only get the Arab Hephthalite, which is what numismatists call these coins of of Julard. And you can see the countermarks on them. There were fifty-seven countermark coins of of this ruler called Skag one of Besut and seven of Julad. So Amber is in northwestern Afghanistan. It's up here. And it's the modern province just to the north of Amber is now called Juzjan. So it's, you know, the name has survived um, and it's in this area called Sar Saripol. And there's some evidence that he's ruling an area slightly larger than, than just around Amber. But there's a separate polity in in Balkh, so he's not he's not the ruler of Balkh. He's the ruler of this area to 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 the west of of Balkh. So Balkh here is, I see there's Mev Al Rud, which is the top of the river that that ends up at the delta of Merv. Um, so coins 
from these two mints are the most common in the, in the hoard. We also know about these people from the Bactrian documents that have been discovered over the last 20 odd years. The, the ruler called Skag is actually mentioned in this document and one of his successors, whose name is Yan, is in this document and Yan is also called Yan Guzgan, like, like Julad Guzgan on the coins and he also has this title King of, of Gar. And the Bactrian documents are dated and w with um, my view is that the, uh, the Bactrian era follows on from the Kushan era, so beginning in uh, uh, 227, a hundred years after Kanishka, and so we get dates which relate to uh, uh, Skag is in the late 7th century and Julad in the early 8th century, and he, he's already replaced by somebody else in the um, 720s. And according to the Arab chronicles, and particularly Al Tabari, by this date, you know, sort of the date immediately after this, the full Islamic administration is established in Guzgan. But even under the Arabs, there, there, is, there is an Arab document from the same source as these Bactrian documents, which mentions somebody called Julad Guzgan, and it calls him Julad Guzgan, son of Guzgan, and that's from the Abbasid period, about 780. So that so the the ruling family continued to be around into the the period of Islamic rule. At, at this period, they're still the rulers, and they refer in these documents to local gods. They're not they don't make reference to to the Muslim god. They refer to Jun, who is a, a local god, the god of the river Oxus. There's no um, references to Islam in the, in these documents, but soon after this, there are Islamic documents, references to taxes being paid to the Arabs, who they call Tajiks, for some reason. There's uh, Skag Guzgano, and here we have Yan Guzgano, and then King of Gar. And then go back to the coins, trying to, to make sense of the coins. The the first coins from the mint of Ambir seem to be copies of Arab Sasanian coins. And there's one without a date because it has two mints, you know, that where the original mint name, the Arab Sasanian camp mint BBA, is on one side, and where the date would have been is the name of the mint Ambir. So it's a it's a copy of a, an Arab Sasanian coin that still retains the name of Khuzru. And then you have copies of coins issued by um, local governors. In, from Khorasan, more coins just copying the original um, Khuzru II prototype, and then more governors, and then it's replaced by coinage in the name of Julad Guzgan. Um, and the first of those coins, the reverse, is the same as the previous coins copying the Arab governors, um, and is in the same um, cycle, which seems to be the Yezdegird era. And then immediately after that, there's a coinage um, which is dated in the Arab, seems to be dated in the Arab era, in the 80s of the Arab era. And the countermarking, you know, um, Skag's countermarking stops on coins like this, based on coins to this date, sorry, to this date, and then Julad's coinage, latest countermarks are on coins from the beginning of his coinage. So it seems as though he, he he's countermark, you know, he also countermarks earlier coins, but um, for the first phase of his own coinage, the coins are still being countermarked, and then he stops countermarking them. And these coins that he countermarks um, don't have his tamga on them, um, but the ones that he doesn't countermark have his tamga as well as his name. This construction is problematic because until recently, until, well, until I started working on them, all these coins were dated 64, 65, 66 through to 69. But there's something seriously wrong with that because the first coin coinage of in the name of Julad is dated 69. So this coin and this coin can't have the same date because this one was issued several years after this one. And the the way Pahlavi is written makes it very easy for, for one to either opt for reading it as 60 or 80. They're very difficult to tell apart. And because Walker originally published them as reading 64, 65, etc., everybody else has just followed that without going back and thinking, 
is this, does this make sense? Well, the sequence of the coinage shows that it doesn't make sense. Um, and so um, I've opted for reading them as in the 80s. You'll, I'll show you a coin which sort of reinforces that idea. So the, the, these are coins from the phase when Arab Sasanian coins are being copied. You can see the Bismillah is the distinguishing feature which separates a coin of Khusru II from an Arab Sasanian issue in um, copying Khusru II. Um, so this is a Khusru II coin, but it has, I mean, instead of this one, instead of saying Bismillah, it says Guzgano, which is the, the family name of the, the rulers. And they all have the mint name of Anbir on them. And then after a while, you start to see it written in Bactrian as well as in uh, Pahlavi. And the dates on them seem to all be in the Yazdegerd era because there is a, a coinage from the same die as one of, as a coin of one of the Arab governors. It's die link, there's a die link between the coin dated 64 and dated 74. 74 is the Hijra, 64 is the Yazdegerd era, which is 10 years later. Um, so one can be fairly confident this is the Yazdegerd era rather than the um, Arab era. And then we have pieces issued in the name of Julad. So you have Julad's coin, which is in the same Yazdegerd era. And as well as saying Am Amber, it's copying a coin of Merv. So it has the name of Merv here, and then the name of the mint in Bactrian, Amber. And then we have a, another coin of the same of year 85. But in between them, from the, from the mint of Amber, an Arab coin was issued in the name of the local, of the um, nearest Arab governor, who's called Yazdegerd al Muhalla, And on the back of it, it has Julad Guzgan's name. At, so it's, it's going there. And it's dated in the Hijra at year 84. So it seems likely that this is 85, not 65. And in this area, it has an Arab inscription which says, um, struck as tax in Juzjan. So it means, you know, the tax from Juzjan or whatever. Anyway, it's, it's, it looks pretty illegible there, but there are three examples known and one can be confident that's what it reads. And in year 85, the year after this, there's a coin which is issued with the name of Julad Guzgan, this miller, and it's, you know, countermarked by um, Julad himself, and it has this same inscription but without the end of it, it says, struck as the jizya tax. So this coin is sort of lifting part of the inscription off that coin. So it's presumably still being used to pay tax to the Arabs, but it's being issued in the name of the local ruler of, of Juzjan. And then the rest of his coinage, so there's, there's the, um, the beginning of it, and then there's an additional inscription added, which um, says, king of Gar, and this carries on till year 89, 707, and I found die links between the different dates, you know, so it's a, it's a fairly coherent group of coins. And there is one coin which has all the characteristics of a Julad coin, it has his Tamga, but instead of his name it says struck at Amber, but in Pahlavi. So it's this, this idea of the Arabs saying um, Duriba and wherever it is. So it's, it's a Arab, a, a Bactrian translation of that term. And there's also a coinage which has a similar inscription struck at a place called Kuum, which we're not quite sure where it is. But on the back it has a, has a Bactrian inscription which acknowledges a Turk ruler. And, you know, perhaps this is from a period which I'll show you in a minute. There, there's, there's tension between the Arabs and these local rulers in northern Afghanistan, so it's possible that this is a sort of coin in revolt against the Arabs. And it's issued in the same year as the last of Julad's coinage. And so that's, that's the inscription on the back. Difficult to translate because Bactrian is a language that really has only been known properly for the last 20 years when all these documents appeared. And this is um, the two translations offered by Nick Sims Williams, who is the master of this language. And he says it's either the um, Irkin of Kag, who is a local ruler, and the, the Silig, the, the Kagan, who is the, the top Turkish ruler, who is his father, or it's the, the son of this ruler, um, Appa, who is the Irkin of Kagan. It's very, he can't, he can't distinguish, you know, sufficiently to know which, what is the, 
precise meaning. And it's on the back it says um, this has this um, pros pro prosperity to Silik. So Silik the, the Kagan is obviously the, the supreme ruler at this time. And this this is um, the, again the provinces of modern Afghanistan um, with Anbir located in, just up here, just below the modern district of Jhajan. And in the 10th century, there's a, there's a writer who is working for the ruler of um, Juzjan, who writes an account of, the, of um, the area. And his description of it says it's sorry, to the west of Balkan and Bamiyan and to the east of Merv, which Merv is here. And all these areas marked in purple are under his control. Whether this was the case in the 7th, 8th century, one can't be 100% sure. Um, but it gives some indication. And there's one of the coins related to to um, the Anbir coins, which instead of Anbir has what looks like the mint name of uh, Far Faryab um, on it. This is the area where we're looking at. And this is where Masson acquired them. So there is also, rather unexpectedly, a post-reform Arab dirham dated year 79, which is the first year when the dirham was widely issued um, in the in the um, Umayyad Caliphate from Anbir. So there was sufficient Arab control at times, both for the coin issued for the tax and also for this coin to be issued with the mint name of Anbir. Whether it was struck in Anbir, I can't be 100% sure. It could have been struck in Merv to sort of say, you know, this is the coinage for Anbir um, because the central Caliphate has said, you know, everybody's got to issue these coins. And we have coins from um, Herat and Sistan and the year after from Balkh, etc. So it's a, so here are Julad Guzgan's coins and the contemporary Arab governors. And this, this Yazid bin al Muhalab is the one who issues this uh, tax dirham and the year after Julad issues one. So the, the post reform coin is up here. So it's quite, quite early within this sequence. And from the Arab historians, we know that the, this ruler, who's called the, ne the Nezak of Baghdiz, is a, a military commander based to the west of Juzjan, who first of all forms an alliance with the Arabs. So he's, he's uh, got this link up in year 84, and then he breaks with them and goes and revolts. And he gets the ruler of Juzjan to join him in his revolt. So he, he's having this fight with the Arab governor and he in rebellion and then in 709-10 he, he dies. The rule of Juzjan joins him in 90, so the year after he stops issuing coins and then um, also dies. So Julad is dead the following, so two, within two years of the last dated coin that he issued. So that coin that mentions the mint of corn could be an issue of this ruler because he he's associates himself with the Kagan, who is based in Balkh. And so the, the historical picture from the Arab sources and from the coins creates a, a very coherent picture. Having done that, I started looking at other coins and found that the tax coins issued by um, the Arab governor, Yazid, has Julad's countermark on it, but also has a, a countermark in Sogdian. And going through sale records, CNG must have had a hoard of these coins, and this coin probably came from that hoard, and they all have the this countermark on them, which has this Sogdian inscription, which is a name, however you pronounce that, <laughs> and it means possessing a hundred favours, so it's a sort of beneficial name, and it starts off appearing as a countermark with a countermark of a Tamga, and then you get the combination of the Tamga and the countermark, the uh, countermark name, and then you start to see the name appearing in the the margin of the coin, um, but still countermarked, and then you get the tamga and the name appearing on the coin. So very similar to to what's happening with Julad of going from countermarks to writing names on the coins. And um, if we go back to the coinage that's being issued um, by Julad and by his r relations, has an extra margin. Arab Sasanian coins have margins here, but they don't have an outer margin. And 
when we look at this coinage, the, these are countermarked imitations of Kuzuru, and they don't have this outer margin. But then, like the coins of Julad, you get these outer margins appearing. So they're following the same sort of numismatic fashion of adding this extra margin onto the coin. Now, just as I was finishing this, I found another coin on online, which has the same countermark, but also has a countermark with a face on it and the same tamga. So what it, however you pronounce that man's name, that's what he looked like. <laughs> um, but he's using Sogdian and using Arab Sasanian style coins. So it's difficult to know exactly where he was because he's probably not in Sogdia because in Sogdia there's a different currency system at this time. And then this phenomenon also happens south of the Hindu Kush as well. So we have this is coin um, issued by the ruler of Zabulistan, which has this tamga up in the field here, and the same tamga appears in front of his face, and on the coin it gives you his name, which is Pangol. And so the reverse is copying a Sasanian coin of Khuzru II. Those are sort of Khuzru II type coins, but with added inscriptions. I have yet to work out what these two inscriptions mean, but uh, maybe it'll come. And th this coinage is issued in this area. The, the main centers are, are in Ghazni and in Kabul, um, but it also includes these areas. So there's some coins issued down here. And they also controlled Gandhara as well. And this is, this is the, the first ruler that we encounter. His name is uh, Tegin. And his first coins are very interesting because it has a different dating system on. We know about this man from Chinese source, um, who, who refers to him as the Kurasan Tegin Shah, so Usan Pele Shah, and it says that in 739 he abdicated and gave over to his son. And his first coins, we have a coin dated 706 in the Bactrian era. So the inscription here in Bactrian gives a date in the Bactrian era, um, which gives a date of 706. And he also issues coins with uh, back, his name in Bactrian on the front and an, an inscription in uh, Devanagri on the back, which is still difficult to decipher. I think, I think it's saying Shriya Devi Manjushri. Harry Falk read it differently. These coins um, of, of Tegin, the, the early ones are, sort of look like this, but then he starts to copy the Sasanian coins, um, both Khuzru II's own issues and potentially this, you know, this is the design that's appearing on the um, Arab Sasanian coins as well. And you'll notice this extra border on the back, in, the same as the coins north of the Hindu Kush. Um, and this coin is dated year 77, but it doesn't say what era. So we'll come back to that in a minute. And this coin is dated year 2. And this one has the mint name of, of Zabulistan, which is essentially Ghazni in Afghanistan. And this state of Khorasan, which is what the Arabs also called their eastern territories, um, it means essentially the east. And um, in one of the Bactrian documents dated 729, there's a, um, an inscription which refers to a prince of Khorasan. So the next ruler after Tegin, according to the Chinese, is called Fromo Khazar. So that's the, the Chinese um, transcription, and it essentially means Caesar of Rome. And there was a Byzantine mission going to China that passed through this territory, so presumably they picked it up. Um, think, oh, yeah, this, is, this is what the ruler of the world, Western world called himself, so I'll call himself myself that. And his coins exclude the first one, but these all have his name, Fromo Kizaro, um, written um, in Bactrian on them. But the coins which say have the name Pangul seem to run in parallel to them. There are no silver coins, sorry, no copper coins of this ruler and no copper coins of this ruler. So if you put them together, they look like they are the issues of the same ruler. So Pangul adopts this title, King of Rome, Caesar of Rome. And they're issuing coins at Zabulistan, but also this, this mint, which is al Ruhaj, which is near Kandahar. And they have years one, three, four, and seven. And then, um, there's, the next ruler is called, seems to be called Spur. His, his, um, name is in 
written in Pallavi as something like Spur, or it could be a corruption of Shapur, difficult to be uh, sure. And his, you know, the, the coins of the Caesar, Rome Caesar finish in year seven, and Spur's coins begin in year eight. And anyway, so his coins go from year eight, nine, ten, and fifteen, and he's issuing coins at Zabulistan, but also at this mint near Kandahar. And the Chinese say that when the son of Tagin, called Caesar of Rome, took over, then a few years later, the Chinese, Chinese were asked to, uh, to acknowledge that his son was now the ruler. And his name was called uh, Bofu Jun. Doesn't sound anything like Spur. It's, um, it's possible that, uh, like his father, he had more than one name. Anyway, so we have, we have a sort of, uh, a chronology coming from the Chinese sources and then a chronology coming from the coins. And then there's a ruler called Sandan who has many of the same features, uses the same titles, um, has the same sort of design, and there's no information about him at all. So I'm not at all sure how to fit him in. And he, like some of the others, he has um, Devanagari as well as Bactrian and Pahlavi on his coin. And he has the same crown as Pangol and uh, Fromo Kesar, and his reverse design is more like those of Spur. So he's fitting somewhere into this picture, but it's not clear. And these coins are quite plentiful. So if you then put the Chinese sources alongside the dated coins, so if year 77 on one of his coins, placing him in 708, 709, um, the, the Bactrian uh, era coin in 706, and then if year two is in the Laukika era, which is an era used, it's again, it's the same as the Kushan era, but at a later date, it would be 728. If it was the Bactrian era, it would be 729. And then from, from then onwards, we have this sequence of, of dates on, on the coins down from, from year one down to 15. And if you look at the gap here from one to seven is exactly how long from Khazar rules. So the matching between the Chinese source and the uh, rulers in, who are issuing these coins uh, makes perfect sense. And then about 750, the Kabul, Kabul Shahis start issuing coins, and then all this Arab Sasanian style coinage ceases. But so it shows coinage from this era, from this era. This is under Arab control, so Arab Sasanian coins should here. What's going on here? I have no idea at all. Perhaps there's coinage there, but so far we haven't seen any. Maybe that's the next adventure. <laughs> okay, thank you.